Hello and good evening. Can, oh, I think everyone can hear me in the back. This is very loud, yes? Great. Uh, welcome readers and writers and very lovely and dressed up book people. Thank you all for coming. My name is Luis Jaramillo and I'm the director of the creative writing program here at the New School. This is a very special year for us at the New School. We are celebrating our 100th birthday. Yeah, thank you. Since the founding of the university, writers at the New School have been an illustrious bunch, pushing the boundaries of form while also taking on urgent political questions, writing about war and race and all sorts of inequality. It turns out that the New School and the National Book Foundation share some family members, writers who are students or faculty here and who were either finalists or winners of the National Book Award. Tonight, I'd like to bring into the room with us some of these writers. W.H. Auden, James Baldwin, Grace Paley, and Frank O'Hara. Sigrid Nunes, a current faculty member and winner of last year's National Book Award for Fiction, may actually be in the room with us. I'd like to congratulate this year's finalists. You are now part of this lineage, and we welcome you to the new school. Thank you so much, and let's have a round of applause for our finalists. I'd like to give a shout out and thanks to Lori Lynn Turner, Ben Fama, Whitney Kennerly, John Valdez, and our many wonderful student volunteers. Thank you to Joe Carney in the booth. Thank you to our friends at the National Book Foundation. And now it is my pleasure to invite to the stage Lisa Lucas, Executive Director of the National Book Foundation. Thank you, Lisa. All right, hello everyone, how are you? Every time I see so many people here to hear 30 people read, I'm like, are you sure? <laughs> um, I remember starting, I told this story last year, but I'm going to tell it again, but I remember starting this job four awards ago, and they were like, you have to go to the finalist reading, and I was like, oh, what's that? And it's like, well, literally all of the finalists come to New York and they read, and I was like, in one night? <laughs> and I was like, so nobody else can go instead of me? And then I went, and it was like the most magical night. It's this comprehensive, beautiful kaleidoscope of culture and the world that we live in now. And I'm always really excited for it. I was looking forward to it all day, and I'm excited. Um, this year, even though the New School tried to beat us with 100, uh, we're 70. Um, So we're not as old, but we still have our knees. Um, and it's been a really interesting year. That was a bad joke. Um, it's, uh, it's been an interesting year to kind of reflect. Um, I think that it's interesting to sit back and really think about what 70 years actually means. It's interesting to think about what an institution means. It's interesting to think about what an organization that contributes to building a canon means. Um, and then you get to the moment where all of your finalists are here with you in New York, real, live, breathing, brilliant, beautiful people, and you see the breadth of the places that they come from, the places that they've been, the, the shapes and forces that have made them who they are. And it's really such a beautiful time for fiction and nonfiction and translated literature and young people's literature and poetry because there's so much that we haven't always seen. And we're seeing it now, but we're not only seeing it in a bookstore, we're not only seeing it, you know, wherever, the library, we're seeing it on award stages, we're seeing it reviewed, we're seeing it all the places. And it's changing who we are. And I hope that tonight, having an opportunity to hear from these incredible writers uh, gives you like a real life experience with that breadth, because they're amazing. Um, and I would be lying if I said that I have read every page of every single one, but I have read some of every single one. Um, and it's really an outstanding bunch. Um, last year was the first year that we introduced the translated literature category, which we remain forever excited about. And you guys have a challenge because last year, everybody was so excited about the fact that we were reading in two separate languages that people started chanting Polish, Polish, Polish to try and get Olga Tokarczyk to read. So if you guys aren't lit like last year was lit, I'll be disappointed. 
but we forgive you. Um, tonight we're going to be hearing Arabic, Hungarian, French, Japanese, and Finnish. Um, it's a really special night. So first off, I just want to give a huge round of applause to the 2019 National Book Award finalists. And another quick thank you, our partners, long time, 22 years at the New School, Mary Watson, Lori Lynn Turner, Ben Fama, Louis Hermio. Remember the first time that I said your name last year and I got nervous? The first year, four years ago? It was crazy. I was like, Louis Jaramillo. <laughs> it was awful. Um, and now I'm going to read some names that I might butcher. Um, we are missing a few special voices tonight. Um, Azarine van der Vliet. Alumi will be joining the reading for Khaled Khalifa. Hari Kunzru will be reading on behalf of Adeli Mulzat. Miriam Breden will be reading on behalf of Scholastic Mukasanga. And Isabel Dupuy will be reading on behalf of Jordan Stump. Mozan Marno will be reading on behalf of Yoko Ogawa. All right. We also have to say a little bit of thanks to the process that brought all of these finalists here. We had incredible judges this year, absolutely outstanding judges who read over 1,712 books. And with determination and heart and heartbreak, the judges narrowed that list down to 25 finalists in the categories of fiction, nonfiction, poetry, young people's literature, and translated literature. These finalists, as I've said before, represent some of the most remarkable work being published today. A little quick bit about the National Book Awards. We work to celebrate the best literature in America to expand its audience, not only for one week in November, but year round through our educational and public programming. And our goal is simple, to build readers and to reach them everywhere. So far, we've been to 37 states in the past year. We've donated over a million books to children and families in public housing authorities around the country. We've done the work of inspiring middle schoolers through our after-school reading group book up and promoted an early love of literature with raising readers. Through NBF Presents, we've brought 64 National Book Award honored authors to colleges, libraries, and book festivals around the country to foster dialogue through literature. We've promoted five titles annually that shed light on the issue of mass incarceration in America through literature for justice. And we've continued our longstanding love affair with New York, where we live, and lifelong writers and readers through series like Eat, Drink, and Literary, and Notes from the Reading Life. In the first year of expanded efforts, with support from the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation, NBF Presents has reached over 10,000 audience members nationwide. And it was our first year. Which is all to say that if we believe in anything, it's that we believe in the power of books to change lives and minds. And tonight's finalists remind us why. These 25 books show us all of the varied forms that literature can take while remaining relevant, eye-opening, and timeless in turn. These books are the perfect example of how literature connects us to an idea, to a place, to a community, and leave us thinking long after the final line. That being said, there are 30 readers tonight. So my finalists, please raise your hand if you join me in my pledge not to read over three minutes, despite how illuminating your work is. <laughs> I want to see every hand. I need 30 hands up, 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 up. OK, cool, cool, cool. I have threatened them with my traditional super soaker threat. I'll be over there. Water. Um, uh, thank you again to the finalists, to the teams, friends, family. We're excited about the awards tomorrow, but we're more excited to welcome everybody to New York and to our family tonight. A few last thanks, our board of directors, our staff, Meredith Andrews, Anna Dobbin, Natalie Green, Kia Rivera, Bev Rivero, Jordan Smith, Deanna Taylor, Emily, Emily Knees, thank you for the work that you do. And also, Anna Dobbin. I'm truly about to shut up, but Word Bookstore is here tonight. Raise your hand if you're going to buy a book. That's not enough hands. Still not enough hands. Not enough hands. Y'all out of here.
here at the finalist reading, not raising your hand, please buy a book from Word Bookstore. It keeps us alive. It keeps these authors alive. It keeps us all enriched and happy. So please buy a book, support Word, support these authors, support literature. And now I'm going to leave it to our wonderful hosts who are joining us tonight. We have two really wonderful people, special friends here to join us. Josh Gondelman, author of Nice Try, and Maris Kreitzman, author of Slaughterhouse 90210 and a host of the Maris Review podcast, which I hope you will tune in to right away. We are so excited and thankful to have them here tonight. Take it away. I did a reduced bio. Thank you to Lisa. One more round of applause for Lisa and Yay, Lisa. Lisa. Uh, what a treat. Mm -hmm. Already a treat. So exciting. So ha happy 100th anniversary to the new school also. You know we're talking about literature when something 100 years old qualifies as new, so that's exciting to be here. <laughs> that's a joke. Yeah. We're going to have a nice time. And the, and the National Book Award, uh, National Book Foundation is 70, so that's like sort of old. Yeah. But still got it. Still got it. Yeah, no still doubt. Still got it. Getting classier and more beautiful every day. Mm-hmm. Oh, you sound like a, a, like a grandmother's husband. <laughs> like, but like a second husband. Like he's still trying. <laughs> That's exactly the image I was hoping to pull off tonight. So thank you, It's going to be mostly us tonight. Um, <laughs> this, so here's what's going to happen. We're going to introduce four groups of readers, one group at a time. The group will come up and uh, each reader will read. That, yep. <laughs> That's the whole thing. As I said it, I was like, they could have probably figured it out when it started happening. <laughs> but that's how it'll be. But it's important to mention that there will be four groups, but the, the translated literature finalists will read at the end of each group. Or in the case of group four, and listen for this, they're going to be both at the beginning and the end. So if you hear someone start reading and you're like, I'm not catching this. Maybe it's not just obscure. Maybe it's Hungarian. <laughs> <laughs> That would, that's just something, because I would, you know, worry. Um, <laughs> and, and the translated literature category, as Lisa mentioned, will feature readers speaking in the original languages of Arabic, Hungarian, French, Japanese, and Finnish. That's incredible. Yes. You and guys, then, unimpressed. <laughs> and then the other reader will read the same passage in English for us rubes. Mm -hmm. So this is going to be very, uh, very exciting. If I were reading tonight, I would read the last two pages of my book <laughs> to spoil it because it's your fault for not having read a National Book Award nominee yet. So in your face, lovely audience full of dedicated readers and writers, take that. And of course, Lisa made everyone solemnly promise to read for only two to three minutes. Go with God. <laughs> um, okay, well, so, but first, before we introduce yes. the first group, we would like, am I, I'm not jumping the gun, am I? No, you're not. Wonderful. Let's we would it. like all the finalists to stand and face the audience for a round of applause because everyone deserves it. And it's, it's so exciting to be in the same room. At once. Your 2019 National Book Award finalists. That's as close as I'll ever get to introducing the 1996 Chicago Bulls. So that was very <laughs> exciting for me. So group one is young adult literature. Um, so we ask the following wonderful writers to come up. Akweke Ameze. Jason Reynolds. Randy Rabai. Laura Ruby. Martin W. Sandler. Uh, Larry Price and Azarine van der Vellet Alumi, uh, reading on behalf of Khaled Khalifa. And that's group one, so please, uh, welcome to the stage, group one. I look this forward to your reading. Yeah, it'll take them a couple minutes. <laughs> They're coming around. They're coming around. 
I'm staying here until they get yeah, here. Yeah, we're not going anywhere. Here they are, group okay. one, ladies and gentlemen. Hello. Thank you all so much for being here tonight. I'm going to be reading from my debut YA novel, Pets, and it's about a magical creature that the protagonist releases from her mom's painting. They go monster hunting in her best friend's house. It's not too late to tell him, you know, it's added. I know, she answered, and she did. Jam had seen it enough times in books and movies where one person had a chance to be honest a window of an opening that closed with their silence intact. She knew it would come back and blow up and be worse, all for that window in which something could have been said, and she knew she was right in that moment, inside that window. Redemption was looking at her with those black, trusting eyes of his, his eyebrows thick and messy above them. Jam could tell him the rest of the message Pet had arrived with. She could tell Redemption all of it right now, and it would probably be fine. But her friend had believed her so easily, and everything was going so well as it was. She couldn't contaminate it by involving his house, his family. Pet's version of the story had been breaking her heart since she heard it. She wanted to wait a little before breaking redemptions. Am I a terrible person, she asked Pet. There is no such thing, it replied. There's only what you do. You know what I mean, is what I'm doing terrible, not telling him. You humans and your binaries, Pet said. It is not a good thing or a bad thing. It is just a thing. Okay, but for real, for real, though, Redemption was saying. It's going to show up right here, like right now. Jam couldn't help but smile at his enthusiasm. It was so different from her fears. Yeah, when I call it. Whoa, okay, okay. Redemption arranged himself on the couch and took a couple of deep breaths to prepare. And you said it's huge, right? Like massive. Yeah, it's pretty big. It might be a little scary, especially because it doesn't have eyes. That takes some getting used to, and the claws, and the horns. And the menacing sense of destruction it tends to drag along with it, she didn't add. I heard that, Pet said. Jam almost rolled her eyes. Whatever, just show up already. She felt the air start to weigh down in response, and she looked at redemption. I'm calling it now, okay? I'm ready, he said, his eyes bright. Good, Jam said. It's coming. Good evening. Uh, I'm going to read a short excerpt from my novel, Look Both Ways, which is simply about the 15-minute walk that is unsupervised that young people have when they walk home from school. <laughs> Most walkers walk to the left down Portal Avenue towards some of the other neighborhoods, but to the right, up Portal Ave, is where Chestnut Homes were, where Simeon and Kinsey lived. It took no time because there were very few of their classmates going that way, and the ones who actually lived there didn't walk there. So the path was clear, laid out for Simeon the Grand and Kinsey the Great like a runway to their kingdom, a kingdom where carrying a person on your back was allowed, encouraged even, a kingdom where kings are throned and dethroned daily, where the crown jewels get dropped down sewers and flushed down toilets, a kingdom full of princes like Kinsey and Simeon, princes no one ever bet on anyway. Anyway, like I was saying, we family. Simeon nailed down what he was going on about before they stopped to talk to Miss Post. Exactly, you my brother, Kinsey confirmed, bouncing the blue ball as they approached Chestnut Street. The way Kinsey and Simeon thought about it, Chestnut Street is a paradise. Light poles are like palm trees, bus stop benches like hammocks, and corner stores like island bungalows. There's a smell in the air, a mix of exhaust and exhaustion, also cooked food and cooked hair. There's a feel in the air, a stickiness like walking through an invisible syrup, a thickness to life. There's a sound in the air, a shrill and chill, the scream and whisper of the world making a symphony of so good and so what. Also the sound of Kinsey and Simeon, their voices still young, still sweet like flutes cutting through. 
Most people tighten up when they walk down Chestnut, tuck tails and tuck chains. But for Kenzie and Simeon, this was where they could let loose, where they could run and slap the street signs pretending to dunk, where they could stand on the blue mailboxes like pedestals or see who could balance the longest on the tip top of a fire hydrant, where they could open random doors of random shops and speak to the owners, Mrs. Wilson's beauty supply store. Tell your mama I got new wigs or Mr. Chase's hardware store. Your daddy get the sink to stop leaking yet? Or Sue, who owned the Chinese restaurant and was always too busy to speak to them, but nowhere was better than Fredo's. Good evening, everyone. I'm Randy Rebuy. I'll be reading from my latest novel, Patron Saints of Nothing, which is basically about a Filipino-American teenager whose cousin in the Philippines is killed as part of the war on drugs. I stop just shy of the water's reach and look from the sky to the horizon to my feet. The water is quiet as it gathers, and then it comes roaring back in a low wave that breaks 20 or 30 feet out. Then it pushes ashore, sliding over my feet with surprising warmth, rising to cover my ankles. A moment later, it slips away, leaving my toes sinking into the sand. And it sounds stupid to say this, but I feel like I'm home. Maybe everyone feels like this when they leave a place like Michigan in the winter and kick back on a sunny beach a few degrees from the equator. Maybe in the same way I find myself suddenly considering unenrolling at U of M, they dream of quitting their nine to five jobs, moving here and opening a beachfront restaurant or something. The overwhelming peace of waves and the sunlight makes everything else seem inconsequential. But I can't help but feel like it's something more for me than a tourist's fantasy. Most of the time when I tell someone I was born in the Philippines, they look very interested for a moment. Ah, when did you move to America? They'll ask. When I was one, I'll answer. And their interest will fade, like I was just messing with them. Then they'll say something like, oh, it doesn't really count then. You don't remember anything. I guess not, I'll say, because I never know what else to say. But standing here with my feet in the water, listening to the sound of Tagalog and maybe other languages mixed with the laughter and the crashing of the waves, smelling the chicken in a sal or pork in a grilling behind me as swallows flit past overhead to their nests high in the surrounding cliffs, I feel like that first year mattered in a way I've never felt it did before. Surely the air your lungs first breathe matters, the language your ears first hear, the foods your, first, your nose first smells, and your tongue first tastes, the soil you first crawl upon. My conscious brain might not remember, but something in me does. I step farther into the water until waves break against my chest, pushing me back toward the shore. But I keep going forward as if headed for those distant islands. Sand and small shells crunch underfoot. I shiver, I dunk my head, stay under as long as my lungs will allow and then break the surface. The water runs down my hair and my face, the salt tingling on my lips. I go out a bit farther until my feet can no longer touch bottom. Treading to keep myself afloat, I look back at the beach and wave at my titas chilling in the shade. They wave back and one of them shouts something I can't hear. I wave again, turn to face the open sea. It starts to rain lightly even though the sun's still out. It seems impossible that at this moment, this country contains countless girls in the same situation as Reina was in, countless men whose unchecked appetites serve as the teeth of their trap. It strikes me that I cannot claim this country's serene coves and sun-soaked beaches without also claiming its poverty, its problems, its history. To say that any aspect of it is part of me is to say that all of it is part of me. Thank you. Hello, my name is Laura Ruby. I'm reading from my novel, 13 Doorways, Wolves Behind the Mall. It's about two teen girls, one living, who uh, Frankie, who's just trying to survive life in a Chicago orphanage during World War II, and one dead, who is telling us Frankie's story as she's trying to put together the pieces of her own life that ended during World War I. I'm gonna read from the first chapter, Our Lady of Perpetual Sorrow. A wash of sleet fell on the guardian angel's orphanage, blurring its outlines, making the place look hazy and gaslit, like the cover of some cheap gothic novel. A dram of poison, secrets can't be kept. 
I passed by the larger building that housed the older children and went right for the baby house, the way I always did. In the baby house, the cribs were lined up in tiny rows like gravestones. Maybe that's why I was so drawn to them, little cradles of life. The babies, chubby baby faces peeking out from the blankets, new baby eyes screwed up tight, slept like kittens, all shivers and fits. They cycled their legs and gnawed on their fists as if their hands had been smeared in honey. I visited each crib in turn. Hello, you baby, I said. Good morning, cupcake. Like everyone else, sometimes they heard me, sometimes they didn't. When they heard me, their tiny bud lips opened and closed and opened again as if to tell me how hungry they were. And though I didn't get hungry the way they did, I knew hunger. I knew how it hurt. Soon, I told them. Soon, the nuns will come and they will feed you and you won't be hungry anymore. Perhaps it was mean to lie, but they were only babies. They would discover the churning furnace of this world soon enough. Thank you. Hello, my name is Martin Sandler, and I've written the book 1919, The Year That Changed America. It is the 100th anniversary of 1919. It is an incredible year. In 1919, women got the vote. In 1919, prohibition came in. In 1919, two men that most of us have never heard of, John Alcock and Arthur Brown, flew the Atlantic nonstop eight years before Charles Lindbergh. In 1919, the greatest sports scandal took place in the history of the United States. In 1919, the greatest medical epidemic in the history of the world and the United States took place. And in 1919, a 65-foot wave of molasses broke out in Boston and killed 61 people. Death by molasses. I would like to read from here the section I wrote on prohibition because the question is how? Could the United States government make a law that said you cannot buy a drink, you cannot manufacture a drink, you cannot sell a drink, you cannot whatever? And it brings up a whole bigger issue, and that's what I've tried to do throughout the book, and that is this whole conflict between personal liberty and the common good. For millions of Americans concerned that excess drinking of alcoholic beverages had become a national epidemic, destroying thousands of families. It was indeed a cause of celebration. For millions of others about to lose one of their greatest enjoyment, it was hardly something to cheer about. America, historian Daniel Orkin has stated, had been awash in drink almost from the start, wading hip deep in it, swimming in it, at various times in its history nearly drowning in it. Arabella, the ship which brought John Winthrop and his fellow Puritans to the Massachusetts Bay Colony in 1630, had more than 10,000 gallons of wine in its hold, along with three times more beer than water. In 1839, Americans' reliance on liquor had become such a national trait that an English visitor to America named Frederick Marriott wrote, I am sure that American, Americans can fix nothing without a drink. If you, if you meet, you drink. If you part, you drink. If you make acquaintance, you drink. If you close a bargain, you drink. They quarrel in their drink, and they make up with a the drink. They drink because it is hot. They drink because it is cold. If successful in elections, they drink and rejoice. If not, they drink and swear. They begin to drink early in life, and they continue until they soon drop into the grave. It was an incredible problem because American families were being broken up. But can the government make that kind of a law? What I write at the end is, the problem is that what some people regard as a positive or even essential change, others perceive as being a step backward. Prohibition was certainly a case in point. Perhaps the greatest lesson to be learned from all these issues is that as a nation, we must make certain that in our desire for progress, personal rights and liberties are not denied. Thank you very much.
Uh, hello, uh, my name is Larry Price. Um, I translated uh, Death is Hard Work by Khalid Khalifa, who um, unfortunately can't be with us tonight. Um, so I'll be reading an excerpt in Arabic, and I'll pass over to Azarine. Um, the book is about a group of siblings who um, take their father's body from Damascus in the south of Syria to Aleppo in the north. And needless to say, that is not a straightforward journey. Um, so I hope you enjoy it. شرح له الضابط أن باهي بالنسبة للسجلات ما زال حيا ومطلوبا لا يحمى إن كانت جثة أو جيفة ثم إضافة أن رئيس الفرعة سيبت عمره في النهاية طالبا منه الجلوس في الغرفة الأخرى ومال استمار معلومات كاملة وتعقيها كان بلبل خائفا ويتصبب أرقا حقا يتقل الجثة جاء عنصر وأخذ مفاتيح الميكروباص من حسين قاضوا من الكراج قريب أخلق أبوابه ونبه الحراس بعدم سماح للميكروباص بالخروج إلا بعد موافقة الضابط The officer explained that according to their records Bolbol's father was still alive and still wanted it didn't matter if he had, in the meantime, turned into a cadaver. Then he added that his commanding officer would settle the matter in the end and asked Bolbol to go through to the other room to fill in and sign this and that form. Bolbol was dripping with sweat. They really were going to take the body. Yet another agent went into the holding cell and took the minibus keys from Hussein. He drove it to a nearby garage and locked it, notifying the guard that it wasn't to be taken off the premises without the express permission of the officer in charge. This same agent came back and led Bolbol into the next room and said that it wasn't the first time this had happened. Another corpse had been arrested the previous month and sent under armed escort to Tishrin Military Hospital, where a committee had had to look into the matter and sign off on the body's status. The corpse wasn't surrendered to its family until all the appropriate procedures had been followed, which the agent then took it upon himself to explain at length. First, they entailed going to the civil records office and updating the deceased status then going to the central registry and issuing a cable that would suspend the astounding warrant. The body would be kept in custody until being transferred to the military hospital for examination, where the death of the wanted man would be confirmed and the legal procedures to permanently cancel the search warrant completed. The agent couldn't seem to make up his mind from one sentence to the next as to whether the state regarded a person as being merely a collection of documents or rather an entity of flesh, blood, soul. Bolbol nodded desperately and asked the agent to go into more detail, but eventually he stopped talking and ordered his prisoner to go ahead and fill out the form. Bolbol felt the pressure of the silent agent's observation as he wrote in the required details about his family members and the members of their extended families and then surrendered the form. Gathering his courage, he offered a bribe to the agent who had explained the procedures to him, referring to it demurely as a goods transit document. The agent gave him a sardonic glance, but they agreed on 20,000 liras if the body was released. The agent took Bolbol back to the holding cell and wished him luck, saying that he hoped the commanding officer would settle the matter swiftly and adding that they would keep the family at the checkpoint till the arrival of the cable that would determine their fate. One more round of applause for Group One, everyone. Amazing. It was such a, such a beautiful set of readings, and Martin W. Sandler managed to list 50% of the reasons I drink. <laughs> 
Um, we are so excited to call up group two, the poets to the stage, please. We're, first poet is Jericho Brown. We also, also Toy Derricott. Ilya Kaminsky. Carmen Jimenez-Smith. Arthur Sizi. And Laszlo Krasnohorkaya and uh, Hari Kunzru reading on behalf of Otili Mulesett. Uh, group two, ladies and gentlemen. I am Jericho Brown from the tradition. Bullet points. I will not shoot myself in the head and I will not shoot myself in the back and I will not hang myself with a trash bag. And if I do, I promise you, I will not do it in a police car while handcuffed or in the jail cell of a town I only know the name of because I have to drive through it to get home. Yes, I may be at risk, but I promise you, I will not shoot myself. The maggots beneath the floorboards of my house, more than I trust an officer of the law of the land to shut my eyes like a man of God might, or to cover me with a sheet so clean my mother could have used it to tuck me in. When I kill me, I will do it the same way most Americans do. I promise you, cigarette smoke, or a piece of meat on which I choke, or so broke I freeze in one of these winters we keep calling worst. I promise if you hear of me dead anywhere near a cop, then that cop killed me. He took me from us and left my body, which is, no matter what we've been taught, greater than the settlement a city can pay a mother to stop crying, and more beautiful than the new bullet fished from the folds of my brain. Duplex. I begin with love, hoping to end there. I don't want to leave a messy corpse. I don't want to leave a messy corpse full of medicines that turn in the sun. Some of my medicines turn in the sun. Some of us don't need hell to be good. Those who need most need hell to be good. What are the symptoms of your sickness? Here is one symptom of my sickness. Men who love me are men who miss me. Men who leave me are men who miss me in the dream where I am an island. In the dream where I am an island, I grow green with hope. I'd like to end there. Hi, everybody. My name is Toy Derricott, and I'm going to read um, the first poem in my book, um, I, New and Selected Poems. Uh, it's called Speculations About I, and it, it's sort of an introduction to um, six books of personal writing. Speculations About I. A certain doubleness by which I can stand as remote from myself as from another, Thoreau. One, I didn't choose the word. It came pouring out of my throat like the water inside a drowned man. I didn't even push on my stomach. I just lay there dead like he told me and I came out. I'm sorry, father, I wasn't my fault. Two, how did I feel? Felt almost alive when I get in, like the Trojan horse. I'd sit on the bench. I didn't look out of the eye holes so I wouldn't see the carnage. Three, 
is I speaking another language. I said I is dangerous, but at the time I couldn't tell which one of us was speaking. Why I? I was the closest I could get to the one I loved, who I believe was smothered in her playpen. Perhaps she gave birth to I before she died. Five, I deny I, and the closer I get, the more I keeps receding. Six, I found I in the bulrushes, raised by a dirtiness beyond imagination. I loved I like a stinky bed, while I hid in a sentence with a bunch of other words. Seven, what is I? A transmission through space? A dismemberment of the spirit? More like opening the chest and throwing the heart out with the gizzards. Eight, translation. Years later, I came back, wanting to be known. Like the unspeakable name of God, I tried my two letters, leaving the O for breath, like in the Bible, missing. Nine, I am not the I in my poems. I is the net I try to pull me in with. 10, I try to talk with I, but I doesn't trust me. I says I am slippery by nature. 11, I made I do what I wasn't supposed to do, what I didn't want to do. Defend me, stand as an example, stand in for what I was hiding. I treated I as if I wasn't human. 12, they say that what I write belongs to me, that it is my true experience. They think it validates my endurance, but why pretend? I is a kind of terminal survival. 13, I didn't promise I anything. And in that way, I is the one I was most true to. Thank you. My name is Ilya Kaminsky, and I will read from Deaf Republic. Uh, I speak with a pretty heavy accent, so hopefully you can follow on the screen behind me. And I want to say it's a real honor to read with this wonderful, wonderful writers. We live it happily during the war. We live it happily during the war. And when they bomb with other people's houses, we protested, but not enough. We opposed them, but not enough. I was in my bed, around my bed, America was falling. Invisible house, by invisible house, by invisible house. I took a chair outside and watched the sun. In a six month of a disastrous rain, in a house of money, in a street of money, in a city of money, in a country of money, our great country of money. We, for the of us, lived happily during the war. Uh, Deaf Republic is a story universe about a country in crisis. But even in a time of trouble, people fall in love. Before the war, we made a child. I kissed a woman whose friends are the neighbors. She had a mouth on her shoulder, which she displayed like a medal for bravery. Her trembling lips, men come to bed. Her hair, whether falling in the middle of the conversation, men come to bed. I walked in my barber shop of thoughts. Yes, I leave it her off to bed on the chair of my hairy arms. 
But parted lips, my bite, my parted lips, lam under the cool sheets. So, yeah. The things we did. <laughs> and finally, um, at the end of the book, things don't end up so well. The townspeople watch them take Alfonso. Now, each of us is a witness stand. Vasenka. Watch it us, watch for soldiers, the row of Fonsa Brabinsky on a sidewalk. We let them take him, all of us, cowards. What we don't say, we carry in our suitcases, our coat pockets, our nostrils. Across the street, they watch him with fire hoses. First he screams, then he stops so much sunlight. A teacher falls off a clothes line and an old man stops, picks it up, presses it to his face. Neighbor just ought to watch him drown on a sidewalk like a body we locked on a... In so much sunlight, each of us is a witness stand. They take Alfonso and no one stands up. Our silence stands up for us. Thank you. Good evening. Um, I'm Carmen Jimenez Rosselló, and I'm going to Carmen Jimenez Smith. God, that was a brain neural thing happening. That's an old version of myself. I'm going to read a poem called Self as Deep as Coma. When I was a girl, I thought clouds were God and that we dialogued about sin which mirrored my desires. When our talks made me paranoid, I counted the letters in each word I heard, turned them backward or rearranged them alphabetically to dodge the buzz of my head. Other times I was the sadder side of the coin and the air around me felt like jewels, then abyss, pulling the hair from my head and a type of catatonia. My family thought I should lift myself with mind, lift myself from the bed, from the couch, as if the body were the mind's queen. We've seen the world, my family would tell me. In the world, suffering is hunger, War, disease, they said, and because those calamities were terrible, I was ashamed for the insignificance of mine. What I had, I had made, they said, and I should cast it off like a snake molting skin, so I would try each of my atoms a ton, which led to a thought experiment at 11, death by pills. I survived woozy, but alive. No scar left, no redemption or courage, just shame so dark my ancestors called from the fathoms to ask why I sought out their shadows. To end a conversation, tell a story of suicide with a girl in it. She's a ghost desperate for absolution. When I was a girl, I wilted or blew. I burrowed into pain. When I was a girl, I thought my storm would suck me into its eye and uncoil me from what I was. When I was a girl, I worried about who knew I knew. I worried who I could hurt, so I hid myself. We are storms and bargains with heaven, pulses of electricity moving within infinite networks, so much fallibility. What do we bear that comes just from the world? And that what comes from each inside of us, we bear everything, each part. I loved the part when the world was my torrid lover, seduced by the blue blaze beaming from my body. My eye helped me plow through the living room like a comet. I could burn down or out or air, and I could be such a good poet in it sometimes. I liked how brilliant the light words emitted stars I arranged in a sky, like a god who would fall to the earth having made something beautiful and vainglorious. 
Sometimes those were the days, the ones I could hold still long enough to arrange stars without the burn, but I cannot. I have in me a buried spark. I buried it myself. When I was a girl, I collected reams of paper soothed by the white over and over, the hope of starting from blank. I hoped to endure being well enough to conjure a new bright vessel because I wanted to live. Thank you. Hi, I'm Arthur C. and I'm going to read the title poem to my book. And I just want to say it's set um, about 20 miles north of Santa Fe, New Mexico, in the Pewaukee Valley. And if you look west from there, you can see um, Los Alamos, the birthplace of Adam Baum on one of the mesas. Sight lines. I'm walking in sight of the Rio Nambe. Salt cedar rises through silt in an irrigation ditch. The snowpack in the Sangre de Cristos has already dwindled before spring. At least no fires erupt in the conifers above Los Alamos. The plutonium waste has been hauled to an underground site. A man who built plutonium triggers breeds horses now. No one could anticipate this distance from Monticello. Jefferson despised newspapers, but no one thing takes us out of ourselves. During the Cultural Revolution, a boy saw his mother shot by a firing squad. A woman detonates when a spam text triggers bombs strapped to her body. When I come to an upright circular steel lid, I step out of the ditch. I step out of the ditch, but step deeper into myself. I arrive at a space that no longer needs autumn or spring. I find ginseng where there is no ginseng, my talisman of desire. Though you are visiting Paris, you are here at my fingertips. Though I step back into the ditch, no whitening cloud dispels this world's mystery. The ditch ran before the year of the Louisiana Purchase. I'm walking on silt, glimpsing horses in the field, fielding the shapes of our bodies in white sand. Though parallel lines touch in the infinite, the infinite is here. Thank you. I'm Harry Kunzru. I'll read the beginning of Ottilie Monse's translation of Lajlo Krasno Hokkai's Baron Van Kaim's Homecoming. Warning. He took an apple out of the basket, rubbed it, raised it to the light to examine it, made sure it was shining everywhere, and raised it to his mouth as if he wanted to bite into it. He didn't bite into it, though. Instead, he drew the apple away from his mouth and he began to turn it around in his palm while his gaze ranged over the people standing around assembled before him. Then the hand that was holding the apple dropped into his lap. He sighed deeply, leaned back a bit, and after a long silence, which in the whole heaven-sent world meant nothing at all, he said, speak to me, 
say whatever you want, although he would actually recommend that no one say anything at all, because the person could say this or that, and it wouldn't have any meaning anyway, because he wouldn't feel himself in any way, shape, or form to have been addressed. You, he said in a metallic voice, will simply never be able to address me at all because you don't know how to. It's more than enough for me if you somehow handle your instruments because that's what's needed now, for all of you to somehow handle your instruments. Because what we have to do is the one single possible performance. Any other performances are automatically excluded. There is no after. Just as accordingly there is no before, and apart from your admittedly modest compensation, there is no reward whatsoever. Of course, accordingly, no joy, no consolation. When we're finished with it, we'll be finished, and that's all. But I must disclose to you now, he disclosed, and it was as if that metallic voice had softened just a bit for the very last time, that it will be none of these things for myself either. There will be no joy, no consolation, and I'm not talking about the fact, he said, that I couldn't care less whether there will be joy or consolation or about what you'll all be thinking and feeling following this agreement that we have established. And not in the least about how you will explain the piteous quality of your participation here later on, namely what kind of lies you'll be telling yourselves. I'm not talking about that, but about the fact that there is no joy for me in this whole thing. And my own fee is hardly tenable in view of what we're calling a production here. It shall come to pass, he said, because it will be, and that is all. I don't love and I don't hate you. As far as I'm concerned, you can all go to hell. If one falls down, then another will come in his place. I see in advance what will be. I hear in advance what will be, and it shall be sans joy and sans solace, so that nothing like this shall ever come about ever again. So when I step onto the stage with you, musical gentlemen, I won't be happy in the least if everything comes to fruition according to the command based on that possibility. And now I wish to say this to you as a way of bidding farewell. I don't like music. Namely, I don't like at all what we're about to bring together here now. I confess because I'm the one who's supervising everything here. I'm the one not creating anything, but who is simply present before every sound because I am the one who, by the truth of God, is simply waiting for all of this to be over. The same text in Hungarian. Kivett egy almát a gyümölcskosárból, megdörzsölte, felemelte a fénybe, hogy megvizsgálja, ragyog-e mindenütt. Aztán odaemelte a szájához, mintha bele akarna harapni, de nem harapott bele, hanem elvonta a szájától, és elkezdte forgatni a tenyerében, miközben lassan végigkordozta a pillantását az előtt álló Egybegyűlteken. Aztán keze az ölébe hanyatlott az almával. Mélyet sóhajtott, kissé hátra dőlt. És a hosszú csend után, mely az ég adta világon nem jelentett semmit. Azt mondta, szólítsák, aminek akarják. Bár ő azt ajánlja, inkább ne szólítsák sehogyan, mert mondhatná, hogy így vagy úgy. Csak ennek semmi értelme se volna, mivel ő semmiképp nem érezte be megszólítva magát. Maguk engem mint a fémes hangon, egyszerűen soha nem fognak tudni megszólítani, mert maguk nem tudnak bánni a megszólításokkal. Elég nekem, ha a hangszereikkel bánnak valahogy. Mert erről lesz mostan szó, hogy valahogy bánniuk kell a hangszereikkel. Meg kell szólaltassanak valamit. Megszólaltatni, emelte fel a hangját. Más szóval nincs Azután nincs tehát ezelőtt, és az elismerten szegényes béren kívül jutalom sincs természetesen. Se öröm, se vigasz nem lesz. Ha kész leszünk, hát akkor kész lesz. És ezzel annyi. De el kell áruljam maguknak. Árult el most. És az a fémes hang, mintha enyhült volna itt valamicskét. Hogy nekem se lesz az. Nem lesz öröm, és nem lesz vigasztalás. 
Vagy hogy megállapodásunkat követően maguk mit gondolnak, mit éreznek, vagy tesznek. És egyáltalán, hogy részvételüknek ezt a szánalmas voltát mivel magyarázgatják majd az, hogy mit hazudoznak össze-vissza maguknak. Nem csak erről beszélek, hanem hogy nekem sincs örömöm ebben az egészben. És az én bérem sem állítható szembe azzal, amit itt produkciónak nevezünk. Meg kell legyen, mondta, mert meg lesz. És ennyi az egész. Nem szeretem, és nem utálom magukat. Tőlem akár fel is fordulhatnak. Ha az egyik kiesik, majd jön valaki más. Én látom előre, mi lesz. Én hallom előre, mi lesz, és meg lesz. Öröm és vigasz nélkül, hogy többé ilyesmire már ne kerüljön sor. Nem örülök tehát én sem, ha magukkal muzsikus urak a színre lépek. Nem leszek boldog egy fikasznyit sem, ha a lehetőségre történt megrendelés szerint minden valóra válik. Ugyanis, és ezt akartam még búcsúképpen maguknak elmondani, I don't like the music. Vagyis amit mi a, most itt együtt össze fogunk hozni, az bevallom, nem szeretem egyáltalán. Mert én vagyok az, aki mindössze felügyelít. Én vagyok, aki nem létrehoz, csak jelen van minden hang előtt. Mert én vagyok az, aki Isten igazából ennek az egésznek csak a végét várja. Group two, ladies and gentlemen. Yes, please continue your applause. Uh, I'll also issue one quick reminder to please turn off your landline telephones. <laughs> If you brought one, I didn't expect anyone to. And also, if you happen to fall in love with any of the readings that happen tonight, the best way to show your appreciation for an author, aside from applause and tweeting, is buying the book. So it'll be outside, word is selling books. That's the best way. <laughs> Thank and you. Oh, and the reason we're announcing that now is because there will now be a five minute intermission where you can go out and buy books. Um, If it's more than five minutes that you're lingering and not buying a book, Lisa Lucas will spray you with a super soaker. <laughs> uh, enjoy your intermission and then come back and enjoy more reading. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome back, everyone. Hello. <laughs> Thank you. No, you. <laughs> I just stand in one place until lights focus on me, and it <laughs> happens, so let's keep going. <laughs> Group three is the nonfiction finalists for the National Book Award. Absolutely. Sarah M. Broom. Tressie uh, McMillan Cottom. Carolyn Forche. David Troyer. Albert Woodfox. Mariam Briden, reading on behalf of Scholastique Mukasonga, and Isabel Dupuy, reading on behalf of Jordan Stump. Ladies and gentlemen, group three, the nonfiction readers. I'm going to read from the beginning of my book, The Yellow House, from a section called Map. From high up, 15,000 feet above where the aerial photographs are taken, 4121 Wilson Avenue, the address I know best, is a minuscule point, a scab of green. In satellite images shot from higher still, my former street dissolves into the toe of Louisiana's boot. From this vantage point, Our dress, now might size, would appear to sit in the Gulf of Mexico. Distance lends perspective, but it can also shade, misinterpret. From these great heights, looking down, my brother Carl would not be seen. 
Carl, who is also my brother Rabbit, sits his days and nights away at 4121 Wilson Avenue at least five times a week after working his maintenance job at NASA or when he is not fishing or near to the water where he loves to be. 4,015 days past the water, beyond all news cycles known to man, still sits a skinny man in shorts, white socks pulled up to his kneecaps, one gold picture frame around his front tooth. Sometimes you can find Carl alone on our lot, poised on an ice chest, searching the view as if for a sign, as if for a wonder, or else seated at a pecan-colored dining table with intricately carved legs holding court. The table where Carl sometimes sits is on the spot where our living room used to be, but where instead of floor, there is green grass trying to grow. See Carl gesturing with a long arm if he feels like it, wearing dark shades even if it is night. See Rabbit with his legs crossed at the ankle, a long-legged man knotted up. I can see him there now in my mind's eye, silent and holding a beer, babysitting ruins. But that is not his language or sentiment. He would never betray the yellow house like that. Carl often finds company on Wilson Avenue where he keeps watch. Friends will arrive and pop their trunks, revealing coolers containing spirits on ice. Help yourself, baby, they will say. If someone has to pee, they do it in what used to be our den or they use the bright blue porta potty sitting at the back of the yard where the shed once was. Now, this plastic vertical bathroom is the only structure on the lot, written on its front in white block letters on black background, city of New Orleans. Thank you. <laughs> Good evening. What a pleasure to be in this company. I am Tressie McMillan Cottom, and I like to make black women the text and whiteness a parenthetical because I think it makes us smarter, and I enjoy it. So I'm going to read from In the Name of Beauty. When I was 11 years old, my waist caved in and my breast sprung out. I could not be left alone at the school bus stop anymore. I'm not kidding. There was a whole meeting had about it. The vice principal looked me up and down and decided that, yes, my breasts were too big for me to be alone at the bus stop anymore. It was dangerous because men can be dangerous. I had some preparation for that. My mother had been, I believe, sexually victimized as a child. She doesn't speak of it except when her sentences fade out and in in retelling of stories. But it was there and how protective she was of me, an only child of a single mother. There were no men allowed in our house except for family, and even then only under her direct guidance. I wanted your home to be safe, made for children and not adults, she has told me. When you're an only child, you learn to gauge your single parent's emotional needs. It is vital for your survival, and you eventually learn necessary if you're going to help your only adult protection in the world keep you both safe. I intuited from my mother's caution that I should be cautious of men, defensive of whatever I was calling my home at any given time, my heart, my mental health, my car, my bedroom, my checkbook, my dreams, my body. Decades before I valued myself enough to be careful for myself, I was careful so that my mother would not worry. If I knew to be cautious of men, I did not learn early enough to be cautious of white women. The first time a white woman teacher told me about those same breasts, she said they were distracting. It was the sixth grade. 
Over the years, white women with authority over me have told me how wrong or dangerous or deviant my body is. As with that teacher, many of their comments focus on my breasts as opposed to, say, my ass, and I have a lot of both. The next year after this teacher made mention of my distracting breasts, I entered middle school. That's where you learn the rules of sexual presentation. That is where I started to discover that while my breasts distracted some of the boys and men, all distractions are not created equally. At school, unlike home, where much of my social world was filtered through my mother's preferences for African American history and culture, I learned that nothing was more beautiful than blonde. The first time it happened was in middle school, English class. I heard a white boy, a bit of a loser with a crooked haircut, who acted out because he couldn't bear to be unseen, say, ooh, that's a real blonde, about a girl in class, and I was confused. The only hair coloring I knew of at 14 years old was the kind my grandmother used to fix her edges, where the curly gray hairs did not blend in properly with her wig. I had no idea what a real or fake blonde was, but I could intuit, much like my mother's fears, that the slacker boy in the back of the class was communicating some valuable social truth. Later, we watched the musical Grease in high school English class. In the final scene, you know, when Olivia, Olivia Newton-John Sandy shows up at the carnival, she's got on those shiny, skin-tight pants. All the black kids tittered. She looked funny. There was so much space between her legs. That couldn't be safe. You can't walk around unguarded like that. As we were laughing, though, another one of those two tall white boys in the back shouted, my hot damn, Miss Newton-John. And I remember the scene so clearly because that's when I got it. A whole other culture of desirability had been playing out just above and beyond my awareness. While my mostly black and Sri Lankan and Mexican friends traded jokes about gap thighs and flat behinds and never trusting a big butt and a smile. And when the teacher, a middle-aged white woman not unlike the one who once told me my breasts were too distracting, looked at that too tall boy, she smiled at him and rolled her eyes, acknowledging that his sexual appreciation of Sandy was normal and I was the one who was deviant. The teacher and the too tall boy were in cahoots. Sandy, that strange, strange creature, was beautiful. Good evening. Uh, I'd like to say what an honor it is to be among so many distinguished authors. Uh, I want to read an excerpt from my book, Solitary. It's called My Greatest Loss. I had just received word in 1994 that my mom had died. She was 63 years old. The grief hit me hard. I was also enraged. I wanted to hurt somebody. My emotions were all over the place. I wasn't accustomed to feeling out of control, so I didn't go out myself on my hour that day. I didn't want to lash out at anyone. I knew it wouldn't stop the pain or an emptiness. I sat down and wrote to the warden, John Whitley, asking him to make arrangements for me to attend my mother's funeral. I could say, so I could say goodbye. At the time, there was a policy that allowed prisoners to attend funerals of close relatives. I was shocked and devastated when he wrote back and told me I would not be allowed to attend my mom's funeral. He told me prisoners in solitary confinement weren't allowed furloughs. It is, very important, it is a very important custom African-American families to come together and say goodbyes. Because of that cruelty of prison officials in the state of Louisiana, I was once again forced to fight for sanity. There will never be words to describe the pain of this loss.
Since then, the month of December has always been difficult for me. It manifests itself in different ways. I can be moody, depressed, I can feel insecure or not whole. Once in a while, I still get this tremendous ache for my mom that feel like it's never going away. Sometimes it lasts for hours, sometimes days, sometimes weeks. Eventually, it goes back inside. A year after my mom passed away, I was sitting on my bunk, trying to figure something out. When I heard my mom's voice in my head, it was like her voice echoed through the years to speak to me. In that moment, I sat on my bed and wrote this poem as a tribute to the wisdom and strength of my mind. Echoes. Echoes of wisdom I often hear, a mother's strength softly in my ears. Echoes of womanhood shining so bright. Echoes of a mother within darkest night. Echoes of wisdom on my mother's lips. Too young to understand it was in a gentle kiss. Echoes of love and echoes of fear. Arrogance of manhood wouldn't let me hear. Echoes of heartache I still hold close as I mourn the loss of my one true hero. Echoes from a mother's womb, hearts beats hell's dear. Life begins with my first tears. Echoes of footsteps taken in the past. Echoes of manhood standing in a looking glass. Echoes of motherhood gentle and near. Echoes of a lost mother I will always hear. Thank you. I'm Carolyn Forche, and I'll be reading from What You Have Heard Is True. It's a memoir about El Salvador in the time just before the war. Written in pencil. On both sides of the road there was smoke. It was blue and still rising when we passed. Although the fields were already black from being burned, everything was burned. They had shot the cattle, yes, even them, and the pigs they had also shot. So they were lying there, already bloated, and there was a smell of meat as well as death, and a howling that couldn't actually have been heard, but it was there. The wattle in the houses was burned, and the corn in the cribs. We didn't stop. We slowed down. The turkey vultures were above us, many also already on the ground. They don't sing, they hiss. Some things we saw through the field glasses, some with naked eyes. We couldn't tell how many people, we didn't know how long it had been. That's all I told them. Lionel had driven as slowly as he could through the smoke. Look, Papu. Look at this, remember this, try to see. It isn't the risk of death and fear of danger that prevent people from rising up, Lionel once said. It is numbness, acquiescence, and the defeat of the mind. Resistance to oppression begins when people realize deeply within themselves that something better is possible. He also said that what destroys a society, a state, a government, is corruption. That and the use of force, which is always applied against those who have not been convinced or included. He was always talking about corruption, trying to prevent it, to expose it, eradicate it. He was dedicated to the task of bringing the sin to the eye. You want to know what is revolutionary, Papu? To tell the truth. That is what you will do when you return to your country. That is all I'm asking of you. 
From the beginning, this has been your journey, your coming to consciousness. All along, I have only been responding to you. When you ask me a question, I try to place you in a situation in which you might find your answer. I do not have your answers, Papu. I am just a man. Someday, you will be talking to your own people, writing for your own people. I promise you that it is going to be difficult to get Americans to believe what is happening here. For one thing, this is outside the realm of their imaginations. For another, it isn't in their interests to believe you. For a third, it is possible that we are not human beings to them. Look at all these beautiful readers and writers. Thank you. You're almost there, guys. I'm David Troyer, and I am going to read a little bit from the end of my book, The Heartbeat of Wounded Knee. This book is not about the heart that was buried in the cold ground of South Dakota, but rather about the heart that beats on among tribes around the country. And while Wounded Knee was the last major armed conflict between Indian tribes and the US government, there have been many battles since 1890. Battles fought by Indian parents to keep their children, and by the children far away at boarding schools to remember and keep their families, and by extension, their tribes close to their hearts. Battles of native leaders to defeat allotment and other destructive legislation. Battles of activists to make good on the promises their leaders couldn't or wouldn't honor. Battles of millions of present-day Indians to be native and modern at the same time. We are, in a sense, the children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren of those hundreds who survived Wounded Knee and who did what was necessary to survive at first and then bit by bit to thrive. This book is meant to tell the story of Indian lives and Indian histories in such a way as to render those histories and those lives as something much more, much greater, much grander than just a catalog of pain. I have tried to catch us in the act, I have tried to catch us not in the act of dying, but rather in the radical act of living. Because at the heart of the political convulsions that now grip the lovely, trustful, dreamy, enormous country we love lies a human question, a simple one. What kind of country do we want to be? Is this government of ours one that should merely get out of the way? so that America can once again be, in Ronald Reagan's words, a place in which people can still get rich? Or is our government meant to be the angel, avenging or otherwise, of our better nature? It has always bothered me that the very idea of paying attention to or knowing Native American history is tinged with the soft compassion of the do-gooder as a kind of public service. But if we treat Indian stories this way, we do more than relegate natives ourselves to history as mattering only in relation to America's deep and sometimes dark past. We also miss the full measure of the country itself. If you want to know America, if you want to see it for what it is, you need to look at native history and at native, the native present. If you do, if we all do, we will see that all the issues posed at the founding of our country have persisted. How do the rights of the many relate to the rights of the few? What is or should be the furthest extent of federal power? How has the relationship between the government and the individual evolved? 
what are the limits of the executive to execute policy, and to what extent does that matter to us as we go about our daily lives? How do we reconcile the stated ideals of America as a country given to violent acts against communities and individuals? To what degree do we privilege enterprise over people? To what extent does, it, does the judiciary shape our understanding of our place as citizens in this country? To what extent should it? What are the limits to the state's power over the people living within its borders? To ignore the history of natives in America is to miss how power itself works. Thank you. Bonsoir. So I'm going to read from La Femme au Pieds Nus by Scholastic Mukasonga, who is a Rwandan author. La Femme au Pieds Nus is a harrowing, magnificent portrait of her mother, who has been killed uh, together with all the members of the Arthur family in the Rwandan genocide. Souvent, ma mère s'arrêtait au milieu d'une de ces innombrables tâches qui s'enchaînent tout au long de la journée d'une femme, balayer la cour, écossais, trier les haricots, sarcler le sorgho, retourner la terre, déterrer les patates douces, éplucher les bananes avant la cuisson. Et elle nous appelait, nous, les trois cadettes qui étions encore à la maison, non pas par les noms qu'on nous avait attribués au baptême, Jeanne, Julienne, Scolastique, mais de nos noms véritables, ceux qu'à la naissance nous avait donné notre père et dont la signification, toujours sujette à l'interprétation, paraissait dessiner notre avenir. Oumoubiei, Ouamou Birura, Mukasanga. Maman nous regardait comme si elle allait nous quitter pour longtemps, comme si, elle qui sortait rarement de l'enclos, ne s'éloignait jamais de son champ, sauf le dimanche pour aller à la messe, elle se préparait à un long voyage, comme si c'était la dernière fois qu'elle nous voyait, toutes les trois, autour d'elle. Et elle nous disait d'une voix que nous ne lui connaissions pas, comme venu d'un autre monde et qui nous pénétrait d'angoisse, « Quand je mourrai, quand vous me verrez morte, il faudra recouvrir mon corps. Personne ne doit voir mon corps. Il ne faut pas laisser voir le corps d'une mère. C'est vous, mes filles, qui devez le recouvrir. C'est à vous seul que cela revient. Personne ne doit voir le cadavre d'une mère, sinon cela vous poursuivra. Vous hantera jusqu'à votre propre mort, où il vous faudra aussi quelqu'un pour recouvrir votre corps. Jordan Stump wrote the translation of The Barefoot Woman and unfortunately couldn't be here, so on his behalf, I'll, live a, I'll read a slightly longer excerpt of the same passage. Often, in the middle of one of those never-ending chores that fill a woman's day, sweeping the yard, shelling and sorting beans, weeding the sorghum patch, tilling the soil, digging sweet potatoes, peeling and cooking bananas, my mother would pause and call out to us her three youngest daughters, not by our baptismal names, Jeanne, Julienne, Scholastique, but by our real names, the ones given us at birth by our father, names whose meaning, always open to interpretation, seem to sketch out our future lives. Mama would give us a lingering stare, as if she were going away for a long time, as if she who rarely left the enclosure, who never strayed too far from the field except on Sundays for Mass, she were making ready for a great voyage, as if she would never again see the three of us gathered around her. And in a voice that didn't sound like hers, that seemed like something from another world, a voice that filled us with terror, she would say, when I die, when you see me lying dead before you, you'll have to cover my body. No one must see me. A mother's dead body is not to be seen. You'll have to cover me, my daughters. That's your job and no one else's. No one must see a mother's corpse. Otherwise, it will follow you. It will chase you. It will haunt you until it's your turn to die, and you too will need someone to cover your body. Those words frightened us. 
We didn't understand them. Even today, I'm not sure I understand them, but they sent a chill down our spines. We were convinced we had to keep an eye on Mama at every moment, that we had to be ready should death suddenly take her to cover her with her pagne so no one could glimpse her lifeless body. And it's true that death hovered insistently around every deportee in Yamata, but to three little girls, it seemed to threaten our mother most of all, like a silent leopard stalking its prey. All day long, our anxious thoughts stayed close by her side. Mama was always the first one up in the morning, long before the rest of us were awake, to go off to her daily walk around the village. We trembled as we waited for her to come back, relieved when we finally glimpsed her through the coffee plants, washing her feet in the dewy grass. When two of us went to fetch water or wood, we always told the third, whatever you do, keep an eye on Mama. And our hearts knew no peace until we came home and saw her shelling beans under the big manioc. But school days were the worst, when my mind filled with horrific pictures that blotted out the teacher's lesson. Pictures of Mama's corpse lying in front of the termite mound she so loved to sit on. I never did cover my mother's body with her panya. No one was there to cover her. Maybe the murderers lingered over the corpse their machetes had dismembered. Maybe blood-drunk hyenas and dogs fed on her flesh. Her poor remains dissolved into the stench of the genocide's monstrous mass grave. And maybe now, but this too I don't know, maybe now, she's deep in the jumble of some ossuary, bones among bones, one skull among others. Mama, I wasn't there to cover your body, and all I have left is words. Words in a language you didn't understand to do as you asked. And I'm all alone with my feeble words. And on the pages of my notebook, over and over, my sentences weave a shroud for your missing body. Please keep your applause going for group three, the nonfiction readers and finalists. We're in the home stretch now, right? I will say, though, as someone who published a nonfiction book this year that was not nominated for a National Book Award, I just want to say to the National Book Foundation in front of everybody, good call. <laughs> <laughs> I'll endorse much that. much better, yeah. Um, let's, let's bring out the, the fiction writers, huh? Yes, please. Group four, your final group. Yeah, we did. we're doing it. We've heard so many wonderful readings, and we have some wonderful readings left. So, group four, Steven Snyder in Japanese, and Mojan Marneau in English, reading on behalf of Yoko Ogawa. Susan Joy. Callie Fajardo Anstein. Marlon James. Leila Lalami. Julia Phillips. Pai Tim Stavti and David Haxton. Ladies and gentlemen, group four, your fiction readers. Good evening. We will be reading from Yoko Ogawa's The Memory Police, Hisoyaka Nakesho. It's the story of an island where an authoritarian regime forces things to disappear and then punishes those who are unable to forget them. The narrator is a novelist, and at this point in the story, novels themselves are made to disappear, and the books have to be burned. I will read very briefly from the Japanese in the interest of avoiding a super soaker, and Mojan will read at slightly greater length from the English. Hon no yama wa watashi no seitake ijo atta. Oku no ho ni wa mada hinosuite nai mono mo atta ga. Daimeo 
皮張りのもの、分厚いの、小さいの、可愛いの、難しそうなの、さまざまな本名があった。それらが隙間なく寄り添い、燃えてゆくのをじっと待っていた。The pile of books was taller than I was. Some had not yet caught fire, but it was impossible to read the titles. I squinted at the spines, though it would have made no difference had I been able to recognize them. Still, by watching them until the moment they disappeared, I hoped to preserve in my memory something from their pages. There were books of all sorts, some in slipcases, some bound in leather, weighty tomes and slender novellas piled together awaiting their turn in the flames. From time to time, the mountain would collapse with a muffled whoosh, the flames would shoot up, and the heat would grow more intense. After one of these moments, a young woman suddenly moved out of the circle of onlookers, climbed up on a bench, and began to shout something. Startled, the old man and I exchanged a nervous glance. Others in the crowd turned to look at her. She was screaming so frantically that it was impossible to understand what she was saying. Arms flailing, saliva flying, she was clearly agitated, but it was hard to tell whether she was angry or just distraught. She was dressed in a shabby overcoat and checked pants, and her long hair was tied up in a braid. On top of her head, perched at a jaunty angle, she wore an odd thing made of soft material. As she rocked violently to and fro, I found myself fearing it would come tumbling off. Do you think she's mad? I whispered to the old man. I wonder, he answered, crossing his arms. She seems to want them to put out the fire. But why? To stop the novels from disappearing, I suppose. Do you mean she's unable to rid herself of her memories? Poor thing. Her cries gradually rose to something close to a scream, but of course, no one made a move to extinguish the enormous mountain of flames. The people nearby just watched her with pitying looks. They'll take her if she goes on like that, I said, starting toward the bench. She's got to get away. We've got to do something. I'm afraid it's too late, said the old man, catching hold of me before I could move. Three members of the memory police had appeared from the woods and were already pulling on her arms. She tried to resist clinging to the bench, but it was hopeless. The thing on her head fell into the mud. No one can erase these stories! The last words she said as they dragged her away were the only ones I was able to understand clearly. I'm Susan Choi, and I'm going to read from my novel, Trust Exercise. As so often before, they grew uneasily aware of their crotches as they sat down cross legged and felt the icy touch of the linoleum numbing their asses. Most of them had privately concluded that ego deconstruction was some sort of fleshless orgy, and they were helplessly blushing. Their skin crawling with arousal and dread. The wall of mirrors doubled their circle around which Mr. Kingsley paced in orbit. His gaze was cast somewhere beyond them. His very way of gazing told them very plainly how far they fell short of last year's sophomores, of their own potential, of the actors he'd known in New York. They felt their deficit all the more sharply because. The unit of measure was wholly unknown. Sarah tried to see David, but he'd placed himself near enough to her left or her right that she couldn't see him, while far enough that she couldn't sense him. Would David be chosen? Would Sarah be chosen? Joel, Mr. Kingsley murmured in a tone of regretful admonishment, sadness almost at her failure. But what had Joel done? She was pink year round, and a summer's worth of sunburn had her mottled and peeling all over her face and down into the cleavage broadly exposed by her tight V neck top. 
The new raw pink skin turned bright red at the sound of her name. All the curls of dead, half-peeled skin seemed to rustle with fear. Her surface was disgusting, Sarah thought. Joelle, please stand at the circle's exact center. You're the hub. Invisible lines radiate out from you to each one of your classmates. These lines are the spokes. Your classmates and you and these spokes make the wheel. You're the hub of the wheel, Joelle. Okay, Joelle said, <laughs> blushing fiercely, a fountain of blood pounding under her skin. I'd like you to choose one spoke now. Look down the length of that spoke. Someone's at the other end. Someone you're bound to by that spoke, passing through you and passing through them. Who's the person you're looking at? The linoleum doesn't feel cold anymore. Please, no, Sarah realizes, staring straight ahead at Joelle's middle, at her soft belly concealed beneath the tight top. I'm looking at Sarah, Joelle says huskily, her voice almost a whisper. Thank you. Hi, my name is Kali Fajardo Anstein, and I'm going to read from my debut book, Sabrina and Karina's Stories, and I'll be reading from the title story. Sabrina's body lay on a chrome table surrounded by clear tubes and murky chemicals. Her head was propped up on a plastic stand. Her eyes were closed and her whitish mouth curdled along the edges. The room smelled of singed skin, disinfectant, and vinegar. These pretty girls, Carlos, the mortuary director, said, they get themselves into such ugly situations. I stared at Sabrina's body, her dark hair framing the pale calm of her rippled throat. The bruising spanned her entire neck, bluish lines edged sour yellow and circled her indented vocal cords. Broken blood vessels spread to her collarbones, and her bloated chin was tilted stiffly to the right, perched oddly above it all. You'll think you'll be okay, Carlos asked. I exhaled and I hid my hands behind my back, my fingers lightly shaking. I'll be fine. Where's the makeup? Carlos wheeled over a metal table, and on it were several glass jars and brushes laid out in rows and a small cassette player radio. This makeup is different, he said. It doesn't blend as well as your traditional products. You know about the eyes and lips, right? What about them? I asked. Carlos ran his hand above Sabrina's eyes. We sutured them shut to set them in an attractive pose. I used the picture you gave me. She should look like herself. He handed me the photo from his pocket. Sabrina had taken it in my bathroom mirror. She was maybe 21, 22 at the time. Carlos then rubbed a freckle on Sabrina's forehead like he was polishing a piece of furniture. He turned on the radio, the Shirelles, a tune about a man doing all of us, every woman who had ever lived wrong. Carlos told me to find him down the hall when I was done. I walked around Sabrina's body. I reached out, touching her cheek, warmer than I had expected. And I got to work, focusing on disguising the swelling of her temples and chin. Her right cheek had grown stiff with the ridge cutting near her lips, and I filled it in with my thinnest brush, and I stepped back. Her lashes, I noticed, had grown longer in death. It almost made her look shy. With a boar bristle brush, I detangled her knotted strands, and her hair, it shone like spilled motor oil, greens and golds and blue all in that black. Corkscrewed sections bounced off my curling iron, more alive than anything else on that table. 
For her neck, I grabbed a lime green concealer with olive undertones, a normal base coat for problematic rosacea. I dabbed a fanning synthetic fiber brush into the jar and I swirled it over my wrist. It was a good undercoat, even and heavy. Her throat, it felt plastic and ribbed where notches of hardened flesh had risen and stayed, and they didn't give way as I worked the brush from her collarbones to her soft chin. I covered her skin in solid flesh tone, a small pool of makeup congealing in the cup of her sternum. I used a tissue to wipe it away. I considered checking the backside of Sabrina's neck for bruising, but I realized no one, not even my grandmother who had asked me to do the makeup, would see. Sabrina was forever to face ceiling and casket tops padded in pink satin, and once she was lowered into her grave, her throat would collapse, slowly disintegrating into the dark. Thank you. Hi, my name is Marlon James, and I wrote Black Leopard, Red Wolf. And I want to read a story of a character telling a story. So it begins, I will tell you a story. I will tell you a story. I let myself be sold to a nobleman in Nigiki because a slave still had four meals, none by his own purse, and lived in a palace. So why not be a slave? Whenever I felt for freedom, I could just kill my master. But this nobleman had the ear of your mad king, and knew because he would tell anyone who would hear. And since I was in a new game, total subservience to another, I was the one to tell. Slaves are not to be resold in this kingdom, especially not in this city, but he did so. And that was, that was how he made his fortune. Sometimes a slave was freeborn and stolen. The master was a coward and a thief. He whipped his wife at night and punched her in the day so that the slaves could see that no man or woman was above him. I said to her once when he was away, if it pleases the mistress, I have five limbs, ten fingers, one tongue, and two holes, all at her pleasure. She said, you smell like a boar, but you may be the only man in the city who does not smell of salt. She said, I hear things of you men from the north that you do to women with your lips and tongue. I searched through her five robes and found her, and that did what men from the north did with lips and tongues. She made noises louder than when whipped, but since I was hidden under her robes, her slaves thought she was in the, visiting the god of harvest and he was giving her a great rapture. She never let me put anything inside her but my tongue, for such is still the way of mistresses. How can one lie with a boar, she said. You're waiting to see how this ends. You're waiting to see if I ever did pull apart the seas of her robe and take her without her ever asking such, but that is the way you southern men do. Or are you waiting for that moment when I kill her husband, for do not all my tales end in blood? Soon I said to the nobleman, it is not yet a moon, yet I am already bored with being your slave. Not even your cruelty is interesting. I said goodbye, made an obscene sign to the wife, and turned to leave. Yes, in this way I left. Fine, if you must know, I did strike the nobleman in the back of the head with the flat side of my sword, bid a slave to shit in his mouth, and tie the rope around his head to keep that mouth shut. Then I left. Thank you. Thank you all for being here. Um, my name is Leila Lalami, and I'm going to be reading from my novel, The Other Americans. Um, it's set in the Mojave, and it starts with a hit and run in which a Moroccan immigrant is killed. It's told from nine different points of view, and this one um, is his wife, Mariam, and this takes place the, nice, the night he dies. I was trying to stay awake, so I switched on the radio and looked for Claudia Corbett's show on KDGL. 
Usually she's on at lunchtime and I listen to her while I'm peeling potatoes or chopping parsley. But the show is so popular that they rebroadcast it again at 10 p.m. That night, a young woman was calling in to say she had gotten married just six months ago, but she and her husband were already fighting because he wanted to move to Portland to be a nature photographer, and she wanted to stay at her job with an insurance company in Salt Lake City, and neither one of them would change their minds. Listen, Claudia told her sharply, the way she does sometimes when callers start to ramble and refuse to face the obvious. Nobody said that marriage was easy. Marriage is work. When we moved to America 35 years ago, many things took me by surprise, like gun shops next to barber shops, freeways that tangled like yarn, people who knocked on your door to talk about Jesus, 20 different kinds of milk at the grocery store, signs that said, don't even think about parking here. I remember pointing them out to Dries. They even have signs that tell you what you can't think. But above all, I was surprised by the talk shows, the way Americans loved to confess on television. Men talked about their affairs or addictions or gambling problems. Women talked about their weight or plastic surgeries or the children they had outside marriage. Even teenagers had something to say, mostly about how terrible their parents were. And all of it, like it was a normal thing. I couldn't stop watching. The television sat on top of the supply cabinet in the back of the donut shop, and while I was washing dishes or mopping floors, I would watch Sally or Donahue, which in those days were on in the middle of the afternoon, when the shop was quiet. My brother had told me that watching television would help me improve my English, and I will say I learned a lot of new words like paternity test and artificial insemination and AIDS epidemic, but my trouble was pronunciation, how easy it was to say tree when I meant three or other when I meant other. I needed a lot of practice. In Casablanca, I had my two sisters, three uncles, and eight cousins. But here in California, my brother was the only family I had, and he lived 130 miles away. I hadn't realized how far that was until we went from seeing him every day to seeing him only once a month, and sometimes not even that often. For me, that was the hardest thing about living in America. Being so far away, it was like being orphaned. Thank you. Hi there. It's such an honor to be here with these authors and with all of you tonight. My name is Julia Phillips. I'm going to be reading um, just a little bit from my novel, Disappearing Earth. And this bit, it's about two sisters on a beach together. I'm bored, said Sophia. Aliona lay back. The rock was hard on her shoulders, cold on her head. Come here, she said. And Sophia stepped out of the bay, picked her way over, and squirmed next to Aliona. The smallest stones crunched together. The breeze had left Sophia's body as cool as the ground. Want me to tell you a story, Aliona asked. Yeah. Aliona checked her phone. They had to be home in time for dinner, but it wasn't even four o'clock. Do you know about the town that washed away? No. For someone who never obeyed, Sophia could be very attentive. Her chin lifted and her mouth pinched shut in concentration. Aliona pointed down the shore at the most distant cliffs. To the girl's right was the city center from where they had walked this afternoon. To the left, marking the mouth of the bay, were those black hulks. It used to be there, in Zavoika, past Zavoika. They sat under the peak of St. Nicholas Hill. If they had kept walking along the shoreline today, they would have seen the stony side of the hill eventually lower, exposing the stacked squares of a neighborhood overhead. Five-story Soviet apartment buildings covered in patchwork concrete, the wooden frames of collapsed houses, a mirrored high-rise, pink and yellow, with a banner advertising business space for rent. Zavoyka was kilometers past all that, making it the last district of their city, Petropavlovsk Kamchatsky, the last bit of land before sea. It was at the edge of the cliff where the ocean meets the bay. Was it a big town? It was like a settlement, like a village, just 50 wooden houses filled with soldiers, wives, and babies. This was years ago after the Great Patriotic War. 
Sophia thought about it. Was there a school? Yeah, a market, a pharmacy, everything. A post office? Eliona pictured it. Stacked logs, carved window frames, doors painted turquoise. It looked like a fairy tale. And there was a flagpole in the middle of town and a square where people parked their old fashioned cars. Okay, Sophia said, okay. So one morning, the townspeople are making their breakfasts, feeding their cats, getting dressed for work, and the cliff starts to shake. It's an earthquake. They've never felt such a strong one before. Walls are swaying, cups are smashing, furniture is here. Eliona looked to the gravel beside her, but there was no washed up branch for her to, for her to snap. Furniture is breaking. The babies are crying in their cribs and their mothers can't reach them. They can't even stand up. It's the biggest earthquake the peninsula has ever had. Their houses fall on them, Sophia guessed. Eliona shook her head. The rock she leaned against pressed into her skull. Just listen. Good evening, my name is Paitim Statovci and I'm gonna be reading from my book Crossing uh, in Finnish and it's a novel about immigration identity and, and starting over. And I don't know if you noticed, but we're the last ones, so, <laughs> which can be a relief for some, perhaps. <laughs> Sitten kerron hänelle Albaniasta jossa en ole lähtöni jälkeen käynyt. Ensimmäisistä kuukausistani Italiassa, jotka vietin kasarmialueella barissa. Se oli kauheaa, että uskokkaan miten kauheaa on, kun ei osaa kieltä, kun ei osaa puhua muille, kertoa miltä tuntuu ja silti haluaa saada heidän hyväksyntänsä. Ja miten vaikeaa on katsoa, miten muiden elämä jatkuu ja oma on pysähdyksissä, kuin läpinäkyvässä muovissa, väärässä kielessä ja väärässä ihossa. Ja miten paljon se hävettää, vaikka asialle ei voi mitään. Ja miten raivostuttavaa se häpeä on. Niin raivostuttavaa, että tekisi mieli lyödä päätään seinään ja patsaita kumoon. Lyödä jotakuta tai ryöstää joltakulta käsilaukku, koska on liian avuton tehdäkseen muuta. Ja meille määrättiin ruokaajat kuin koirille, sanon vihaisesti. Ja hän on nostanut katseensa jälleen minuun. Nyt hän katsoo minua lähestulkoon pelokkaasti. Ja sanottiin, että ruokaa on tarjolla kuudesta seitsemään. Et uskokkaan, miten nöyryyttävää oli kävellä tiettyyn aikaan hakemaan heidän valmistamaansa ruokaa, ja he päättivät, milloin söimme, ja mitä söimme, ja milloin kävimme suihkussa. Ja sitten saimme vieraiden ihmisten vaatteet, kengät, joihin vieraan ihmisen jalat olivat hikoilleet, kainaloiden kohdalta kellertyneet paidat ja haaroista revenneet housut. Ja meille määrättiin alue, joilla saimme liikkua kuin vangeille. Ja kaikkein naurettavinta oli se, Etten silti halunnut mitään muuta niin paljon kuin olla italialainen. Toivoin, että pukemalla ylleni heidän vaatteensa muuttuisin jollakin tavalla heidän kaltaisekseen. Että saamistani vaatteista, haistamastani tuoksusta tulisi minunkin ominaistuoksuni, vaikka samalla vihasin heitä. And so I tell her about Albania the country I have not once visited since I left, about the first few months in Italy, which I spent in a military barrack in Bari. It was terrible. You can't imagine how terrible it is when you can't speak the language. You can't talk to anybody or tell them what you're feeling, and still you want them to accept you. And how horrible it is to watch as other people simply get on with their lives while you are stuck, wrapped in see-through plastic, in the wrong language, the wrong skin. You can't imagine how shameful it feels, though there's nothing you can do about it. And how infuriating that shame can be. So infuriating that you feel like bashing your head against the wall and knocking over statues, punching someone in the face and stealing their handbag because you are too helpless to do anything else. We were assigned feeding times like dogs, I say angrily. And by now she has raised her eyes and looks at me, almost frightened. They said food would be available between six and seven. You can't believe how humiliating it was to walk up to a hatch at a certain time to fetch the food they had prepared. 
they decided when we ate and what we ate and when we had showers. And we were given strange people's clothes to wear, shoes with someone else's sweat in them, shirts yellowed at the armpits and trousers ripped at the crotch. And like prisoners, we were allocated an area we were allowed to use. And the most laughable part of it was that despite all this, I wanted nothing more than to be an Italian. I wished that by putting on their clothes, I would change and become them. That the smell of the clothes I was given would become my scent too, though all the time I hated them with all my heart. Please continue your applause for group four, our fiction readers. It was a joy to spend the evening with you and all of these wonderful writers. And um, can't wait to see what everyone's wearing tomorrow. <laughs> Um, thank you. Thank you again thank for you. coming out. One more round of applause for all the writers, the authors you heard read tonight, all the guest readers you've heard. Truly an incredible evening of amazing work by people with amazing brains. Uh, the, all the books are available from, courtesy of Word Bookstore for purchase if outside. Uh, do that good deed of making your, your own life better and helping out the bookstore and the authors. And uh, thank you once again. Uh, I'm Josh you. Gondelman. I'm Maris Kreisman. Good night. Thank you.